temple observing all the wealthy, wanting to be noticed as they came with their offerings. They wanted to be noticed. They wanted to be seen. They wanted to be shown. You know, they, they, they wanted the clout in the community. They wanted to be noticed. They wanted the, uh, uh, the, the persona or the perception that, you know, that they'd done what they were supposed to do. So instead of having their eyes focused on the basket or on the drop or on wherever they were supposed to put their, their ties at, instead of doing that, they were actually wondering and looking around at everybody else trying to notice, are they looking at me? Do they see me doing that? Do they see me doing this? Do they see me? Uh, do they see me doing what I'm supposed to be doing? They wanted the attention. They wanted the validation from everyone else. And you know, and if you notice this or not, I don't know if you notice, but in, in, in today's society and in today's world that we live in, it's really ventured back to that most of the way. Before we do anything, we want to make sure that everybody else knows what we're doing. Where we're at, what's going on, like we have to we have to basically broadcast our lives whenever it comes to everyone else. Everyone needs to know what I'm eating, what I'm doing, what I'm wearing, where I'm going, what's happening, what's happening, how I'm feeling, what I'm thinking. And oftentimes whenever we do that, ladies and gentlemen, we begin to see that we are seeking the validation of others instead of concentrating on the power and the love of Jesus. And whenever we do that, I want you to understand that we spend more time looking around instead of looking up. We spend more time looking at everyone else instead of looking at our Savior. We spend more time trying to seek the attention of others instead of the affection of one. Instead of the forgiveness of one, instead of the love of one, it's always about how many likes or how many loves or how many this that I can get or how many people know this about me and how many people know that. These rich folk right here, the wealthy wanting to be noticed as they came with their offerings. Brian, can you put up point number one for me? Nobody needs to see when you sacrifice. Nobody needs to see when you sacrifice. If you're doing it to be seen, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. If you're doing it for the validation of others, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. I don't care how much you give. I don't care what you do. I don't care where you go. I don't care how many people you affect. If you do it with the wrong posture of heart, then you've really not accomplished anything at all. You've not pointed people towards Jesus. You've pointed people towards yourself. You've pointed people towards the kingdom that you're building. The situation that you're doing instead of pointing people towards Jesus. You know, it, I find it kind of... Uh, Funny that whenever Jesus would, would do something, before he would do it, he would steal away and he would pray with the Father. And he would seek the Father. But if you go back to Luke 20, just in a few verses right here, before we get to Luke 21, listen to what he says. He says, within earshot of all the people, Jesus warned his disciples, don't follow the example of these pretentious experts of the law. They love to parade around in their clergy robes so that they are honored wherever they go, sitting right up in front in every meeting and pushing for the head table at every banquet. And for appearance's sake, they will pray long religious prayers at the homes of widows for an offering, cheating them out of their very livelihood. Beware of them all, for they will one day be stripped of honor and the judgment they receive will be severe. Will be severe. Even though they looked like that they were doing the right thing, they were doing it with the wrong heart. And you see, you notice that today, that if we are trying to do the right thing, but with the wrong heart, then we're pointing people in the wrong direction. We're leading people down a path that they may not be able to come back from. In fact, we're leading people down a path sometimes that they will associate church hurt with Jesus when it should be with people. When it should be with people, but it's, it's with people that has the wrong position of heart. I'm showing up and I'm doing it, but I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. The Pharisees would literally walk into a widow's home heart and begin to pray with her. Well, that seems like it's right, but it's being done in the wrong heart. It's being done in the wrong posture. It's being done in the wrong position. And truly, they were there because why? They were there to receive an offering. They were there to further what? Their kingdom. They were there to further their agenda. Not to point towards God, not to bring healing, not to love, not to, not to just wrap their arms around and say, I'm sorry for your loss, not to cook a meal, not to pray. No, they were there to further their agenda. 
And you know what? Here's the thing about it. Whenever we allow things like that to happen, whenever we allow people like that to really lead the bandwagon of, of, of God and who God is and trying to get more people in tune with who God is, when we allow people to lead like that, we will have people fall by the wayside because they're like, you know what? I thought God was a good God, but you just used me. I thought God was so good, but, but you know what? I ended up hurting. I ended up broken. And I ended up in a thousand pieces because I realized that some of the people that were walking around with their clergy robes on and praying these powerful prayers that they really didn't have any intention besides just using me for what I could do. Oh man. Nobody needs to see when you sacrifice. Jesus would steal away in the middle of the night or in the early morning hours just to seek the Father out. He wouldn't just stand up and be like, yo, I'm about to go pray and seek the Father. He wouldn't tell anybody where he was going. In fact, the disciples would wake up and they'd be like, where did Jesus go? Where did Jesus go? Well, Jesus was praying and Jesus was seeking and Jesus was trying to figure out what the next step of the process was. He knew, he knew where it ended at. He knew that it would end upon a cross. He knew that that was his final destination before being resurrected and seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. He knew that. But yet, he still needed guidance along the way. And yet, he still sacrificed along the way. And more times than not, he done it in private. So today, ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you, whenever Jesus looks and he sees he's in the temple, he's in the temple. And remember, this is the same temple that Jesus had come in and he kicked stuff around and he flipped tables and he said, you have made this a den of thieves. You've literally shortchanged people and you've literally took people and you've robbed them and you've manipulated them and you put the coverings over their eyes. Now he's seeing the wealthy people come in. Just wanting to be noticed as they came with their offerings. Wanting to be noticed. I need validation. I need validation. Oh, he's always a good giver. He's always a good this. He's always a good that. He's always, listen, I would rather be known by the relationship that I have in private with my father than to be known by what I do out in public by people. Think about that. Think about that. How many people know that whenever the Bible says that Jesus was talking and he said, you know what, there's going to be a day and a time and a circumstance and a situation whenever people meet the Father and he's going to be like, yo, or these people are going to be like, yo, listen, I cast out demons and I've done all of these things in the name of Jesus and Jesus is going to look and go, depart from me, I never knew you. Man, it looked good though. It was a good act. It was a good show. Nice lights, nice screen, nice presentation, but the power of Jesus wasn't in it. And if the power of Jesus is not in it, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that we will begin to lead people down a road that they may not recover from. That's the reason why people are so jaded by church today. That's the reason why people are so jaded whenever you start talking about Christianity and you start talking about Jesus and you start talking about just being saved and living the right life and doing the right thing. And people already have this vision of what church is and what it does. Well, you know what all church does? They just want your money. They just want your money. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there might be some churches like that. But I don't know if, I, I don't, and to my knowledge, I'm just saying, man, I'm only one person up here on Sundays, but to my knowledge, I don't think we've ever told anybody that's never given a dime in this place to not come back. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, we've told you time and time and time again that even if everybody sits on their wallets inside of this place, God will still make a way. God will still do it. God will still drop and God will still deposit. That's the reason why we told you, like during the pandemic, there was people that was pouring in. We shut down for eight weeks. There was people who were pouring in tithes that had never tied to this place. There's literally people that, that have dropped over a thousand dollars into this place in the last two months that hasn't even stepped foot inside of this place. Because why? Because God will make a way where there is no way. God will do what he does on a daily basis. And, you know, I, I don't say names because, again, these people don't want to be honored. They don't want to. They, they, they didn't say, here, Keenan, here's a check for 500. By the way, could you mention it on Sunday that I gave it to you? No. 
No. In fact, one guy just dropped it on my desk one day. I wasn't even there at the time. He just dropped it on my desk and left. So I just thought that this might help you out a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nobody needs to see when you sacrifice. Sometimes it can get messy when you sacrifice. Did you know that? Sometimes it can get messy. Sometimes, sometimes you can get mad when you sacrifice. Sometimes you can get angry. Sometimes you can cry. Sometimes you can literally just be the worst version of yourself when you sacrifice. Because why do we say whenever you sacrifice, it's something that you don't really have to give. But you give anyways. And that doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. Faith doesn't make sense. Faith is literally what the world is doing in reverse right now. Everything in the world, it has to make sense before we do it. Uh-uh. Faith is right the opposite. It will never make sense. It will never be explained. How did that happen? I can't tell you. It's just God. I can't tell you. It's just God. And then everybody in the world is going to go, well, you wait a minute. I'll, just, I'll figure that out. I will figure that out. That's the reason why I say, you know what, I, 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 I'm not going to be here after the rapture, but I would love to listen to how everybody's going to explain how it happened. Well, there was a polar vortex molecule, uh, this, that, and the other, and there was an open hole in the galaxy, and it sucked everything in and done a 360-degree turn, and, you know, there was a hurricane over here mixed with a tornado over here, you know, and it's like they're trying to explain, but all along it's going to be because the people and the children of God had faith to believe that this thing was going to happen. And you know what? I, I, I've come to terms with this. I can't explain my faith. I just need to live it out. I need to let my life be the explanation of my faith. Because if I say I believe in Jesus, but I'm tore up over here, I'm sending mixed signals. I'm sending mixed signals. If I say I love Jesus and I'm pursuing him over here, but yet I am strung out, messed up, and in the worst version of myself over here, come on now. We're sending mixed signals. I've got to be able, ladies and gentlemen, and nobody needs to see when you say, I've got to be able to go in and to get in the prayer closet. Everybody remember the prayer closet? My old folks remember the prayer closet. You remember the prayer closet, that place where you go and you shut the door and there's no distractions and there's no situations happening around you and you're not praying these elegant prayers and you're not saying, thee thou go thus and all of that good stuff. You are just being real with God at that moment. God, you see me, you know me. You see me, you know me. I was telling Brett and Megan yesterday, I said, you know what? I said, I was so mad at God this week. I was mad. I was so mad at God this week that I literally got in the car one morning and I started driving to the gym and I just started in. I didn't pray. I wasn't praying at all. I was yelling. I was complaining and I was angry. I was angry. I said, Lord, I am tired of being a preacher. I'm tired of being a pastor. I'm tired of being a dad. I'm tired of being a husband. I'm tired of being a worker. I'm tired of doing this. I'm tired of doing that. I am tired of it all. That was that, was that the position. I'm still coming home today, James. It's okay. <laughs> I was tired of it all. And the reason why I was tired of it was, was because I looked at God and I said, it is always an unfair expectation. An unfair expectation. If you're the good worker, they're going to expect you to be a good worker every day. Every day. I had an off day today. That's not you. Sorry. I apologize. I had an off day. If you're the good husband, they want you to be the good husband all the time. That's an expectation. I had a bad day. That's not who I married. Oh, fantastic. The good dad. Right? You're supposed to be at every event doing everything. Andrea asked the kids the other night, they said, she said, does Bobby and Daddy always not spend time with you and are there for you? And Lindy said, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, uh, when, when Daddy's at home and not working. And I was like, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the shirt on your back and the pants on your hind end and the shoes on your feet and the food in your belly and the electricity you have. And, you know, your hair's not matted to your head, so you took a shower, so you got hot water and stuff like that. But, you know, heaven forbid. I said, Lord, it's always an unfair expectancy. And I'm tired of it. Here was my, here was my gripe. I said, I want to 
go and I want to make eight dollars an hour at the dollar store. I want to wear my old school wranglers with my spotty shoes and I want to eat frozen pizza and frozen meals every night of the week. That's what I want to do. And you know anybody that does it, I'm not saying that, that I'm just saying at the end of the day, like I just want to digress a little bit. Sink in. I just want because there are no requirements really to that. I just want to be left alone. That was my prayer. And he said, Ken, it's not an expectancy, it's a dependency. And I said, I hate talking to you sometimes. <laughs> because I want to fuss and I want to complain, and you tell me answers. And I don't like to have. It's a dependency. It's not the fact that they expect you to be a good worker. They depend on you to be a good worker. They depend on you to be a good husband. They depend on you to be a good father. They depend on that stuff. Because if you don't show up to work, the bills are getting paid, and the bellies are getting fed, and the family's not being taken care of. There's a dependency. And so sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, even though I wouldn't get up here and pray that prayer on a Sunday morning, because I'm like, you know what? I don't want to get angry with God on Sunday morning. I want to be able to be like, yo, Lord, thank you. I'm telling you, on a Wednesday morning or a Tuesday morning, I will be real with God in my car. And I have to understand that I had to sacrifice a little bit. I just had to be real. I just had to be real with him. Because he already knows, ladies and gentlemen. He already knows. Come to him and be like, Lord of thou host, I thank you so much for being in the holy presence of all the angels and all of heaven today. I thank you for being a, an astute father and an astounding gentleman. And, you know, like, now, nah, man, like, I just want to be real, Lord. I am so tired of this expectation. Feels like you can't do nothing wrong. You can't fail. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. And you know what? For a minute, it put me into the position of who Jesus was. Even though I will never be able to walk a mile, a minute, or a second in his shoes, it put me into the same position. Because even though I read the Bible and I'm like, oh my goodness, people expected so much out of Jesus. But even though there was an expectation, there was a dependency level on Jesus from the disciples' side. Yep. I depend on you, Jesus. In fact, they depended on him so much that he was trying to teach them miracles and trying to show them that, you know what, I can transfer the same power to you and I'm going to. After I leave this place, I'm transferring over to you. And even though he was saying all of that, there was times and moments that people would show up to get healed. And Jesus was like, what's going on? And they're like, well, I'm wrong to be healed, but your disciples couldn't do nothing. And they're like, we were waiting on you. The only miracle recorded in all four Gospels is the feeding with the fish and the bread. And how many times? <laughs> you can read it all four times. All four times. And every time the disciples were like, yo, Jesus, what are we going to do with all these people? All four times, it's the same. All the way across. What are we going to do? You have the power. What are we going to do? I need you to do it. A dependency. A dependency. Nobody needs to see when you sacrifice. Verse 2. He noticed a very poor widow dropping two small copper coins in the offering box. And he says, listen to me. He said, this poor widow has given a larger offering than any of the wealthy. Right, put up my second point. Oh my goodness. Where are we at? You grow spiritually when you sacrifice physically. You grow spiritually when you sacrifice physically. What does the Bible say? Faith without works is dead. It's absolutely dead. I can't sit here and tell you that I believe Jesus is a healer and then at the same point in time be worried because I have a small red dot on my left foot over here that I can't really explain at the moment. You grow spiritually when you sacrifice physically. Whenever it hurts to give sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, whenever it hurts to do it, and I'm not just talking about finances, I'm talking about in every area. You may have had a really crappy week. Everything gone wrong. Everything happened. I had a really bad morning this morning. I was so mad when I got Maybe I just been mad all week hard. I don't know, but I was mad when I got here this morning. Picked up the wrong peanuts at the store. Cashews was in the honey roasted section. Got mad. I hate cashews. Just throw them down. They're in my car. I'll get to you at the church. Got mad, man. 
Get, to the, get here to the church. I take that big old box of shirts that y'all probably didn't even see. And I'm trying to pick them up off the ground. I had a great idea. I'm going to pick them up and catch them underneath. That didn't work out. <laughs> Dropped half of them in the parking lot. So if you got any black stains on them, I apologize. Made it to the door. Guess what? Door's locked. Right? Holding the box to the door like this right here. Pull my keys out. My key is through three rings. I can't even get the key out to unlock the door. I'm getting mad or harder. I'm getting mad. I'm sitting here jingling these keys, holding this box. And I thought, God, if it's the death of me, I'm going to let this box go. I'm going to sit here and jingle until somebody shows up. 10, 15 minutes, don't care. I got that door unlocked. Sure did. Made it up here. We cleaned yesterday. Guess what? Door was shut. <laughs> Hands full, trying to open up the door. Guess what? Lord's like, you know what, Keenan? <laughs> sometimes, here we go, teaching point. Sometimes, in order for the door to open, you have to have your hands empty. You can't be carrying things through closed doors. Man, sometimes I hate talking to God. I might have been, Brett. I don't know. But anyways... Teaching moments, ladies and gentlemen. Teaching. There is never not a teaching moment with Jesus. You can't be carrying things through closed doors. Sometimes the door is open, yes, but watch this. You have to have the faith to reach out and touch the knob and turn it. We think that every time that God is going to present an open door opportunity, that the door is going to be open. Let me tell you something today, and let me break it down, and let me try to bring down just a little bit the, the, the hypervigilant faith that some people want you to have, that, you know, that if there's not going to be any resistance, there's not going to be any fights, there's not going to be any battles whatsoever. Let me just tell you, that's a load of bull. Because the higher up you go, there's going to be more resistance. Closer you get to God, there's going to be more resistance. So everybody is like, well, the Bible says, the Bible says, knock, and it will be opened. Now watch this. How many times have you went over to somebody's house and you knocked on the door? Yeah, the door might have been unlocked, but they said, come on in. What did you do? Did you stand back and was like, I knocked. That was the door supposed to open. What did you do? If they said, come on in, you reached out and grabbed that handle, didn't you? You reached out and grabbed the handle and opened up the door. Can I tell you today, ladies and gentlemen, that sometimes you will come to doors that God is wanting you to go through, but they won't be open, but they will still be unlocked. He's wondering how much faith you're going to have to reach out and grab the handle. This is not even part of my sermon. But I'm just trying to tell you that in order to receive what God has in store, sometimes you're going to have to sacrifice physically. That means you're going to have to stop carrying so much crap with you and you're going to have to set it down in order to receive what God has on the other side of the door. What does God want to do in your life? And he's like, just quit carrying it. I can't allow you to go into the next room carrying the same junk from the other house. I can't allow you to receive something new if you're still holding on to something old. I can't allow you. I can't allow you to possess this area of the land with an old mindset. Watch this. Because why? Because don't you remember in the Bible whenever they sent out the, 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 the 12 spies and 10 of them came back with a negative report? Even though God said, I'm going to give you the land. But they came back with a negative report. Why? Because they had the old mindset. They focused not on the land, but on the giants. Oh, they're huge. Well, they were huge because everything in the land was huge. He said, man, there is grapes over there the size of two-story buildings. That's paraphrasing. That's just me saying that. But think about that. And they looked and they said, man, if we was to go in there and fight them right now, we would be slaughtered. God said he's going to give it to you. Well, you know what? You're going to have to sacrifice physically in order to grow spiritually. Let me tell you something. How much more do you think David grew that day after he stepped up and he took on the life? 
How much more do you think he grew in the spiritual aspect whenever he stood before Goliath and he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. I bet after that giant fell, he was like, Ooh, look what God can do. Look what God can do. And that's the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, whenever one miracle happens inside of this place, right here, we should look and go, look what God can do. If he can do this, I bet he can do that. If he can literally save somebody's soul, I bet he can redeem them from being addicted. I bet he can forgive them for being broken. I bet he can work in somebody's life. You know what? That's kind of crazy. You're telling me that I can live from glory to glory. That's what the Bible says. From glory to glory. I'm not going to tell you there's not going to be a valley in there. The Bible says you're not supposed to stay in the valley. From glory to glory. Oh my goodness gracious. I want to praise him. I'm going to praise him because it's a glory to glory. He is who he is. And if I can literally see him do something on this side, I bet he can do it on this side. Amen. I can't. Listen, let me tell you something. If, if it's 2021 and we're still praising him for the soul he saved in 2020, there's something wrong. I'm not saying God's not good. What I'm saying is, is that his, his grace, his love, his mercy, his blessings are fresh and new every morning. Yes, praise him for that soul. But why are we living in the newness of God every day? Why are we not living in the newness of what God can do? You grow spiritually when you sacrifice physically. Everybody remember the widow of Zarephath? I love this story. I probably talk about it twice a month. But I love the story. Because the Bible says that she was literally about to die. Down to her last meal with her son at hand. Now, I don't know about you. Because me, I can look at me and I'm like, man, you know, I failed, whatever. But to know that my son was depending on me, and I couldn't provide, and I couldn't protect, and I couldn't do what I needed to do for my son, that's a whole other level. That's a whole other level of disappointment, ladies and gentlemen. That's a whole other level. But watch this. God sent somebody. He sent somebody by the name of Elijah. He said, go find the widow. She's just out there collecting. I'm just out here collecting. What are you doing? Well, I'm just about to fix a meal for me and my son. And then she's like, we're just going to die. That's pretty hardcore, right? To just, just come out and say that like that. We're just going to die. We're just going to eat this meal and then we're just going to die. Because that's all we got left. That is the only hope that we have left. Welcome to 2021, ladies and gentlemen. That's the only hope that we have left. I'm just going to do this, and I don't know what else to do. I don't know where else to go. I don't know where else to turn to. I don't know what else. I, I just don't know. I just don't know. I just don't know what else to do. You know what? You want to know what the leading cause of death was in 18 to 46 year olds in the year 2020? It'll surprise you. Suicide was actually about number three or four. You ready? Overdose. Overdose. Fentanyl overdoses. Number one. 18 to 46. Year 2020. Because why? People don't know what else to do. They don't know what else to do. I've tried everything else and I don't know what else to do. So I'm going to mask my pain. I'm going to mask my sacrifice. I'm going to mask my disappointment. And I'm literally just going to take this until I don't feel anything whatsoever. Whatsoever. Can I ask though, Nick, how many times that God's trying to raise up an Elijah inside of this house to go to somebody and say, what are you doing? Well, my life is really bad right now. Well, I'll tell you what, how about you serve God and see what happens. People are looking for an answer, ladies and gentlemen. They are looking for protection. They are looking for provision. They are looking for promises. They are looking to be made free. They are looking to be made whole. They are looking 
to be made righteous. They are actually looking to be looked at instead of stepped over for a change. And I guarantee you there was other people that had passed that widow that day that probably never said a word to her. But Elijah stopped by. What are you doing? Cooking a meal. Then I'm going to die. What did Elijah say? Makes no sense because that's what faith is. I need you to serve me first. Listen, dude. I've got one meal that we're going to fix for us. And you want me to serve you first. Makes no sense. God, I've got $9 in my checking account and you want me to give 30 Makes no sense. Lord, you want me to stand up here and praise you and give you thanks, glory, and honor after the week that you know I've had. Makes no sense. Lord, I just found out that somebody in my family has stage 4 cancer, but yet you want me to continue to read this Bible like you're a healer. is. And that's what faith does. And ladies and gentlemen, whenever we begin to learn to sacrifice physically, I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about praising when it does hurt. I'm talking about praising and worshiping when it doesn't make sense. I'm talking about giving to God whenever you don't have it to give to God. That woman did not have a meal to give to God, did she? She had one left. And it was for her and her son. But Elijah said, you need to get your priorities straight, lady. What is it you've always been saying this year? We are so distracted right now. We're so distracted by everything else that's happening in the world right now. And our focus and our priorities should be God and God alone. If we would learn to give everything that we have to God first, I promise you there would not be a need met. There would not be a, 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 a dream or a desire that was broken through. There would not be an expectation that was not met inside of this place if we would give it to God first. Because God multiplies, ladies and gentlemen. Where we add, God multiplies. Where it takes us five years, God can do it in five seconds. If we would just give it to God. If we would just give it to God. I told Clint earlier, I said, Clint, maybe one of these days people listen to me in this place. I don't know when. Maybe they will. Maybe they will. Watch this. In the physical, in the physical, ladies and gentlemen, Sometimes you have to give in the physical when it doesn't make sense in order to grow spiritually. Because when you give and it doesn't make sense, you'll be able to praise and it won't make sense to anybody else. That's the reason why with all hell breaking loose around everywhere, and you're like, God's still good. I'm still praising. I'm still raising my hands. He's still the Father. He's still on the throne. What do you have to praise about? I have everything to praise about. Don't come and talk to me if you're like, oh, I'm going to tell you everything bad that's going on in the world right now. Don't talk to me. Why? Well, first and foremost, because if you read this word right here, you would know, you would not be surprised by everything that's happening in the world. Because the Bible says it's supposed to happen. I would not be surprised by it. I don't need to tune in. I don't need a daily update. I know what's going to happen. But I also know that there is a promise of a soon coming king. I also know that, I also know that he's coming back for his church without spot or blemish. I know that. I know that I'm a shadow of a doubt. That if my heart is covered by the blood of Jesus, then I'm covered. I also know that if my family is covered by the blood of Jesus, they're covered. I also know that if people know Jesus in the form of a relationship called salvation, they're covered. And that is something to praise God about today. That is something to praise God about today. I know I may sound like a broken record, but my God, if you've got lights and you've got heat and you've got air and you've got running water and you've got a roof over your head and you've got clothes on your back and you've got a little bit of food in your belly and you've got, you got a job and you've got a situation working like that, all of that stuff is something to praise about. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what the problem is, ladies and gentlemen? We judge a sacrifice on its size. We do. We think that the bigger the, the bigger the size, the bigger the sacrifice. And it's right the opposite in the kingdom of God. Because those wealthy people dropped in all kinds of money. But they dropped from surplus. This widow dropped in two copper coins from poverty. And Jesus said, she's given more. She's given more. 
she's given more than what these wealthy people have because she's given from poverty. She didn't have it to give, but she gave it anyways. She gave God all that she had. All that she had. And let me ask you a question today. How much are you giving God? I'm not even talking about your money. People get all hot and heavy over their money. I'm talking about every area and aspect of your life. How much are you giving God? I don't have much to give God. I, don't have, I can't sing and I can't clap. I can't do it. Like, none of y'all can clap on time. <laughs> none of y'all. I've said this before. Like, we are not going to be the most spiritually, like, in tune clapping church yet. Like, no. It's just not going to happen. There's just some things that you're going to be known for in the community, and that's not one of them. We're not going to be called to lead a clapping session. It's not going to happen. But ladies and gentlemen, how much are we giving God? Every year. Am I giving God everything that I've got to give? Because if I am, then that's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. God, I'm giving you all my time. That's a sacrifice. Because then he's going to redirect your priorities when you give him all your time. Well, that sucks. Because I've already made a schedule out. Well, if you give God all your time, then guess what? He's going to rearrange your priorities in your schedule. Watch this. If you give God all of your ability, He's going to make you better at what you do. What? You mean to tell me it's like if I sing for God, He'll make me a better singer? Absolutely. Not only that, He'll make you a better worshiper. And that's totally different than a singer. He'll take you into deep places. That you've never been. If you give him all your ability. Right? You mean to tell I'm not that smart. I don't really understand the Bible. I bet if you give God all of your mind. I bet he can open up the scripture to you. I bet he can. I bet he can. I bet if you just start reading and say God I don't understand it. But help open up my eyes to understand it. Help open up my mind to understand it. I'm giving it to you God. You know when we see God move at the end of our abilities. Think about that. We can't take another step and God picks us up and carries us. We can't take another breath and then God breathes in our lives. I can't face another day, but God wakes you up. I can't go another moment. God keeps you going. It's at the end of our own abilities. It's whenever we learn that we have to sacrifice physically to grow spiritually. It doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen, but faith will never make sense. They'll never be able to explain it. One more and then I'm moving on to my last point. There was a widow, not with Elijah, but Elisha. There was a widow whose husband had died, and he left a pretty sizable debt. And she didn't know what to do. She didn't have no way to repay it. And Elijah says, I need you to go into the community and collect all the pots and pans in the community and bring them home. <laughs> Did you just hear me? I don't have nothing to give. I don't know how I'm going to repay. Why do I need pots and pans? Why do I need this? Ball? He said, because you're going to fill them up. I don't have anything to give. I don't know if you understand me or not. There's a communication problem, God. I've told you. I don't have anything to give. He said, I need you to exercise your faith and get all the pots and pans you can because you're going to start filling them up and they're not going to stop being filled up until you get your debt repaid. Isn't it kind of crazy watching this that she didn't have the oil, but yet she had the pain. It's almost like if you believe God to supply your every need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, he'll do it. Absolutely insane. Absolutely insane. That's what faith is when you sacrifice in the physical, the gain, in the spiritual. What was the verse that Tara read first? She said, love God with all your heart. Let me tell you something. If you love somebody with all your heart, you're not only going to love them, but you're going to trust them. You're going to trust them. Think about that. If I love you with all my heart, that means that you have broken down the barrier of my life. You have come into my life, and now I trust you with my life. I trust you with my life. 
Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If I trust you with my life, that means I have to let go of my life. That means I have to walk in the unknown. That means I have to believe for things that I can't see. Oh, man. Hebrews 11, 1, I mean, it's so cliche. It's so cliche. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, whenever you go out in the world and you start talking about big things that people can't see yet, and they're like, you're stupid. No, I just have faith. You start talking about the magnificent works that God is going to do inside of a community or inside of a home or inside of a family or even inside of a loved one somewhere that everybody else is giving up on and you start talking in faith like that, it doesn't make sense because people can't see it happen. But oh, when they see it happen, then they can't explain it. And that's the reason why it's so important, ladies and gentlemen, for us to live out our faith with our lives. You grow spiritually when you sacrifice physically. This lady sacrificed in the physical. She gave everything she had, everything she had to live on. Brian put up my last point. Verse number four says this. For the rich only gave out of their surplus, but she sacrificed out of her poverty and gave to God all that she had to live on. You sacrifice to get the surplus. You don't give the surplus. You sacrifice. To get the surplus. To get the more. You sacrifice to get everything that God has in store. You literally let go of it so God can give you more of it. That still doesn't make sense. I'm letting go to get more of it. Why would I just hang on to it for? I don't know about you, Nick, but I tell you what. If I hang on to the same bread every day and I keep eating all that bread, what's going to happen? That bread's going to get stale. It's going to get moldy. It's going to get to the point where you can't eat it no more. That's the reason why I say, you know what, we can praise God for soul saving in 18, 19, 20, whatever the case you want to, but I don't want to live off that bread every day. And God thought so much of the Israelites that every single day he blessed them with new fresh manna, even though they were complainers and gripers and whiners, but every morning they woke up to new fresh And all they had to do was to sacrifice. They had to sacrifice. They had the old mindsets, Clint. Take me back to Egypt. I know what's happening in Egypt. I know what's happening. I know what's happening. You know what's really funny? Is, is new people showing up to church telling about how their old church used to do it. My old place, we, we used to do it like this at the old place. Why don't you go back? Don't you go back then. Don't be coming in here and saying, well, you know, I mean, I used to do it like this. Well, you know what? It's a new mindset. It's a new mind frame when you walk in. It's a new mind frame that literally before you have it, you're going to have to give it. You're going to have to give in order to have. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but, but we don't have we don't have like you know like 500 people knocking down the doors and volunteer staffs and teams and all of that good stuff. So if you want a clean church, you're going to have to clean. If you want a meal, you're going to have to cook it. If you want more, you're going to have to give. If you want to see this thing grow and take off and expand and do whatever it is that we've spoken about to do inside of this place, then we as individuals are going to have to give in every area. In every area. Physically, financially, emotionally, and spiritually. Every area. We're going to have to give, ladies and gentlemen. doesn't make sense. Can I tell you today that we don't have a five-year plan in this place? Is that bad? I don't know. Can I tell you we don't know what the next season holds. All that I can tell you is that we know who holds tomorrow. That's it. That's all I got. But that's enough. That's enough. 
We serve a God who's never got it wrong. wrong. He didn't get it wrong with you, Mackenzie. He didn't get it wrong with you, Ryan. He didn't get it wrong with you, Todd. He didn't get it wrong. If you're here and breathing, you are by God's grace and design to be here. Isn't that absolutely insane? Who is our quickest critique? Our own selves. Our own selves. Our own selves. We will fish for compliments all day long from other people, but when it comes to critiquing, I don't have to. I don't have to talk to nobody. I'll just start critiquing myself. I'll just start talking about myself. Talk us all down. But can I tell you that whenever you begin to talk down on yourself and who you are and everything you messed up and how many times you got it wrong and how many times you failed, I want you to understand today that you are talking about God's creation. The moment that you look at yourself and say, I'm ugly, you're talking about God's creation. The moment that you look at yourself and say, well, I'm stupid. That's God's creation that you're talking about. The moment that you look at yourself and you begin to talk down on yourself, you are going against what God has created. God created you for a specific time and moment such as this. And he created you the way that you are for a reason. And at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, it takes all of us to make this thing go around. It takes all of us. It takes all of us to make this thing function. You may not do anything besides coming here and sit in the pew and amen and clap. That's fine. That's fantastic because you want to know why? If you're not here, the gospel can't spread. The gospel can't spread. Yeah, it's good to have a job. Yeah, it's good to have a title. Yeah, it's good to do something. But let me tell you something. There's going to be every church in America is going to need Christians who literally just come and sit and, and clap and praise and help lift each other up. Oh, my goodness. You may not think, watch this, you may not think that that means very much, but that you judging a sacrifice by size. You don't know how much value you added to the service by being here today. You don't know how much, you don't know, ladies and gentlemen, how much inspiration you just gave to somebody. Let me make this message Christmassy real quick. Just real quick. I don't know why you're going home and talking to me. I can't even talk about Christmas today. You know what I mean? Let me, let me tell you. We talked about the widow of Zarephath with Elijah. We talked about the widow with Elijah. Now watch this. There was also a girl by the name of Mary and Joseph who God seen fit to bless I mean to bless with being able to bring forth the Savior named Jesus we would look at that as an inconvenience I don't know how I'm going to shoulder all this responsibility I don't know I don't know how this is going to work out Lord, I, I'm nobody. Exactly. You know, this is just Canaan. But you know why I think God blessed Mary and Joseph with this baby? Because they didn't have a clue what they were doing. They didn't have a clue what they were doing. They didn't have a clue what was happening, how to do it, how to manage it. It was almost like, ladies and gentlemen, that they didn't have a clue, so they were going to have to depend on him. He didn't introduce Jesus into a structure or a confine with people that were like, well, we're going to raise him like this and we're going to teach him this and we're going to be over here with this and we're going to do this. No, he introduced them with common folk people who were literally like, I don't even know what we're going to do with all of this. In fact, Joseph was about ready to throw in the towel and head out of town because in those days and times, if you were literally pregnant and unmarried, then you might as well have been kicked out of town yourself. Cancel culture didn't start in 2019. It was way back. Way back when. And then an angel showed up to 
Joseph one night and said, yo, you need to stick this thing out. You need to stick this thing out. You need to stick this thing out. And man, I felt that in my spirit so much because Joseph didn't have a clue what was going on, how it happened or anything else. But God said, you need to stick it out. You need to sacrifice your plans. You need to sacrifice your vision. You need to sacrifice your life. You need to sacrifice your dreams. You need to stick this out because what's going to happen is bigger than what you are. It's bigger than what you are. Here's something to mull over. Let's bring it all together. I made a Christmas seed just for a second. But watch this. The widow was there fast. Had a son. The widow was Elijah. Had a son. Mary, Joseph, had a son. It was almost like, now listen to me. Lean into this. It was almost like their dependency upon God delivered someone else's dependency upon them. It was almost like that when they sacrificed to God, someone else was taken care of. It was almost like that whenever they gave out of sacrifice, someone else was blessed because of it. Can I tell you today, ladies and gentlemen, you don't give to be blessed. You give to be a blessing. Wipe out. Wipe out. That's that consumer Christianity that we talk about all the time that everybody's been jaded by. If I give, oh, God's going to bless me with it. If I give, if you give, you give in order to be a blessing. And you will be blessed more by that than what you will if you just give to be blessed. Isn't it crazy that because people sacrificed to Jesus, someone else was taken care of? Now, here's my question. I'm going to ask you to rope this all in together. Who's depending on your sacrifice today? Who's depending on it? Who's depending on you to give to God today? Who's depending on I didn't understand the scope of it whenever I was a child. I didn't understand. But, and I laugh about it, and we laugh about it in here, but whenever my mom would come and kick open the door on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and say, you're going to church today. I don't feel like it. Well, you felt good enough to stay out all night last night. Yep. Yep, I did. Well, then you're going to feel good enough to go to church today. If she wouldn't have been able to sacrifice to God, then I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Because of the sacrifice, my heart, my soul, my life depended on her sacrifice to God. Amen. You can't complain about your kids if you're not showing them God first. Help me. I mean, I've been a parent for a little bit. I've not been there for 40 years or nothing. But I feel like at the same point in time, I can offer a little bit of advice and say, you know what? You can't blame your kids for being hooligans if they don't even know who God is. You can't blame your kids for out of whack priorities if we're not showing the priority. Our sacrifice depends, someone depends on what we give. Someone depends on what we give. Someone depends on what we give. That's the reason why heart every year at Christmas time we help a family out, whether it's in this church or whether it's in this community. Because why? Because it is dependent upon what we give through the year to get to that point. And you know what? I can sleep a little bit better at night knowing that someone's going to have a blessed Christmas this year, even though it might have strained me some Sundays to write out a check. Or it's strained me some Sundays to drop in the tide bucket. But you know what? I'm sleeping better than I know that there's smiles on people's faces. And people are being blessed by a ministry. And people are being blessed by the hand of God because we decided to give. The sacrifice that I gave was a blessing to someone else. 
if there's anything that I want you to understand, coming to church, if there's anything I want you to understand, you don't do this for you. You don't do this for you. You sacrifice for a blessing to someone else. You sacrifice for a blessing to someone else. I'd seen Harden, but I didn't know Harden. But through this church, I got to know Harden. I've seen Dawn and I know Dawn, kind of. But I've not really got to talk to her until this church. I've seen Clint and I know Clint, but I never really got to meet and talk to Clint until this church. I didn't know you two. For some days I wish not. Just <laughs> but I didn't know until this church. Amity, how old are you? 19. I want you to understand how special it is. Because at 19, I can tell you my head and heart was not being in church on Sunday mornings. Yes. Amen. Yes. But I want you to understand how special it is that you woke up and chose to be in church today. And it wasn't because mom and dad drug you. It wasn't because anybody else drug you. It's because you got up and you made a decision Amen. to come to church. Amen. I'm proud of you. Amen. Amen. person about Jesus and some days are in tune, some days are closed off, some days they don't want to talk at all and I want to get this person a Bible. I want to get this person a Bible. But I don't want to screw up. I don't want to get the wrong Bible. And I, I, I don't want to take offense to it. I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. But I want you to understand something. Ladies and gentlemen, you can never go wrong with giving somebody a Bible. You can never go wrong with sacrificing God's word and saying, it changed my life. It changed my life. I hope you can do the same for you. It changed my life. It changed my life. But watch this. Whenever we sacrifice our pride and we sacrifice Oh, I might get this wrong. Or we sacrifice, oh, I might offend somebody. Or we sacrifice, oh, I might say this the wrong way. Or uh, uh, we sacrifice our feelings and our emotions. We sacrifice all of that. And we say, oh, to the greater good of the kingdom of Jesus. This young lady right here. This young lady right here, we came in this morning, oh, and she she watches service every Sunday. Every Sunday she watches service. And this is her first Sunday here today. But she said, you know what? She said, I ain't been to church since, what, August? Right? She said, August. She said, you know, I got, I got in my car this morning. She said, you know, I could go to this church. Not this church, but you know, I could go to this church. I can go to my son's church. I can go to my mama's church or I can come to fruition today. And she said, you know what? She said, I just prayed and said, you know what? Wherever my car leads me is wherever I'm going to go. It's wherever I'm going to go. And then she walked through the doors. But can I tell you today, it's because 
you made a sacrifice that someone else is going to get the blessing for. Because watch this. She told me at the very beginning of the service, she said, my daughter actually said, you need to watch that church. You need to go to that church sometime. She said, well, you need to get in church. But I'm going to believe with you that because you sacrificed today, that's going to be the blessing that leads to her and her family getting into church. I'm going to believe that with you today. There's a sacrifice, ladies and gentlemen. What are we willing to give? Mary and Joseph gave everything. They gave their life, their hopes, their dreams, their plans, their visions, their opportunities. They gave everything just to serve. Because of God's power resting upon Mary, the Bible says that she brought forth a Savior and a King. It would be named Emmanuel, who was God with us. Jesus. Jesus. I'm not saying that you're going to birth Jesus in your life today. But what I am saying, ladies and gentlemen, if we sacrifice, if we sacrifice today, there will be blessings that we never thought were possible, that we'll start seeing come in abundance. That's not preacher hype. That's in the Bible. Just read it. If we trust God with what we have, He will give us what we need. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. What are we willing to sacrifice to see? It's a good question. What are you willing to sacrifice to see? What God wants to do. What are you willing to sacrifice? Your time? Your money? Your efforts? Your mindset? Your job? Your family? Your friends? Your status on Facebook? What are you willing to sacrifice to say, I want more of you, God. What are you willing to sacrifice to see the hand of God? That's the question. How bad, we've asked this before, how bad do you want the hand of God and the blessings of God in your life? How bad? I don't have anything left to give. That is a great place to start. That is a great place to start. I don't have anything left to give. That's a great place to start. Give what you have left, and God will give you more than what you need. Do you trust Him with it today? Do you trust Him to do that? If it was your last phrase, would you give it? If it was your last dollar, would you give it? If it was your last hallelujah, would you give it? If it was your last prayer, would you give it? If it was your last, would you give it? Would you give it? Would you give it? As we pray, as they play, a minute 12, 112, a minute 12, ask yourself the question Sacrifice. What would I sacrifice to see the blessings of God? What would I sacrifice to see the hand of God? Is it worth it to give it all? I think that's a question that doesn't need no answer. It's worth it to give it all. It's worth it. It's worth it. The Bible says this, the wages of sin is death. Oh, but if you give it to God, there's a life waiting for you that nobody can explain. 112, and then we're going to pray together. If that's you, what are you willing to sacrifice today? This altar's open.